best-selling uh, writer and author. Uh, you, you, you probably all um, know Lulabi, the Chanson Douce, which is, uh, was made into a film that's called The Perfect Nanny, and uh, that has uh, garnered her France's most prestigious literary, literary prize, the Goncourt. And she was also the first Moroccan woman to win the prize. And the novel sold 600,000 copies in its first year of publication. And it has been translated into 42 languages. I must confess that having uh, to re recruit nannies for my sons just at the time that the, the book was published, I haven't read it. <laughs> and if, if, you've, if you've seen the film or, or read the, the book, you will understand me, I think. Leila Slimani also writes on women's sexuality, and her first novel, Adèle, Dans le Jardin de l'Ogre, won the La Mamounia Prize for the best French language book written by a Moroccan author. And uh, everybody also knows uh, her non-fiction book, Sex and Lies, True Stories of Women's Intimate li Lives in the Arab World. Her most recent book, In the Country of Others, Le Pays des Autres, uh, is an on ongoing trilogy that offers a fictionalized version of her own family's story. And I think, Leila, you're writing the third volume of the tri trilogy at, at the moment now, and I'm sure that many of us want to know, want to have it as, as, uh, as, as fast as, as we can. So no pressure there, but <laughs> <laughs> I know the, the, the second volume has just been released. So. Uh, so Leila is a prolific author, but she's also a human rights uh, advocate, and uh, she's also so she's also what we call in France uh, an écrivain engagé, uh, in the grand tradition of uh, Zola, uh, Sartre, uh, de Beauvoir, and she's particularly active on human rights issues uh, such as gender equality, equality for people of all backgrounds, and fighting against racism and oppression in all its form. She won the Simone de Beauvoir Prize for Women's uh, Freedom for a, ca a campaign to help Moroccan women speak out against unfair and obsolete laws, um, such as relationship outside marriage, which have made them into, um, into self-described outlaws. Third, uh, after, being a, after uh, being a prolific author and a human rights advocate, Leila is also um, a French president, Emmanuel Macron's personal representative for the promotion of the French language and culture. And she carries out this mission with dedication and without ever giving in to taboos, which really helps to strengthen the influence of French throughout the world. This evening, we are joined by our dear friend, Simon Sanders, who has kindly agreed to partner with the embassy again. And really, thank you very much, Simon. It's very, very important for us to have you. And I want to take the opportunity to congratulate you on your, on your new MSNBC show. Um, and we will, we will also uh, have our podcast introduced by Tracy Madigan, who's the host of our, our embassy's uh, Francophiles podcast. And uh, I really encourage you to uh, to check out uh, to go and check out this uh, podcast on the uh, on the embassy website. We will be recording uh, the debate um, now for our podcast during the uh, during the evening uh, as soon as I stop talking. Actually, so I'll, I'll be I'll be short. <laughs> and uh, on, on this podcast, there is an episode for really everyone: gastronomy, literature, fashion, space, sex, and rock and roll. No, I, I think I made the, the, last, the last one, but... but it's it's tonight, Sex and Rock and Roll. <laughs> Maybe for, for, the, for, the, for the, 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 the next one. So I leave it at that for now, and thank you, thank you very much all for joining us. Thank you, uh, Simon and, and Leila, for being here. Give it up for Tracy, everyone, and the Chief of Mission. And now Tracy. I will note before Tracy gets started, before we start recording, this is a live recording of the podcast. So I want to hear the energy. I want to hear the hand claps, okay? This is, yes, yes, yes. All right, all right. Tracy, everybody. Thank you, everyone. So welcome, yes. This does mark the beginning of the podcast episode. So for friends and family who couldn't make it tonight, please tell them about the Francophiles podcast. This conversation, as well as other conversations, can be found. Francophiles is the name of the podcast. So I wanted to give a more formal welcome to Simone Sanders, because she is not only a political strategist and a commentator, but as was mentioned, she has a brand new show 
which airs on Saturdays and Sundays at four o'clock. And then there are new episodes that are streamed on Peacock on Mondays and Tuesdays. The name of the show is Simone. And so <laughs> she came up with the name. <laughs> She brings her energy, her focus, and her curiosity to that show the same way she's going to bring it to the conversation tonight. So she, tonight, with Layla, is going to talk about things such as the need for uncomfortable conversations. She's going to talk about pushing boundaries. And she's also going to talk about the power of storytelling. So we are in for a very, very interesting conversation tonight. So please, once again, Welcome, Simon and Leila. Thank you. Well, let's get started. Thank you all for being here tonight. Leila, I'm so excited to talk to you. In hearing that introduction, um, you are not only a diplomat, you are famous, okay? You're a human rights advocate. You are a writer. So I want to start with talking about you as a writer. And I was so fascinated as I was researching for this conversation um, just last week. On May 15th, writers of the world came together at the United Nations. Um, there was an emergency session. It was the Emergency World Voices Congress of Writers that was convened. And you were there at that session. Obviously, there are very tumultuous things happening in our world right now. Um, Europe is, is watching. And the world is actively, most of the world, is actively working to help Ukraine um, fend off this unnecessary war being waged on them by Russia. So talk to me about that convening of those writers and, you know, did y'all solve world peace? Did you find the answers in this convening? Tell us what went down. Yeah, in this very difficult and very tragic context, context um, I think that the Pan America wanted to do something. They wanted the writer to say something and to raise their voice and to express many things. And I think that what they wanted also is uh, to do something like they did in 1939, just before the invasion of Poland. And everybody knows that it didn't prevent, of course, the invasion of Pro Poland and it didn't prevent the war. But the idea was, was just to give uh, the opportunity to writers and especially Ukrainian writers because there, there was there uh, a delegation of Ukrainian writers who gave us um, a testimony about their experience in Ukraine. And you know there is a very famous poet that I think many of you know called Anna Akhmatova. She's a um, Ukrainian poet. She was ra she was born in in Odessa. And I remember at the beginning of uh, her poem Requiem, she tells a very beautiful story. Anna Akhmatova. She experienced the worst of dictatorship and of the Soviet uh, Empire. And her son was in prison. And one day she was in front of the prison just waiting. And a lot of women were there around her, shouting, screaming, not understanding what they were doing there. And at one point, one woman looked at her and she says, she looked at me with her blue lips and she said, can you describe this? And Anna Akhmatova said, yes, I can. And I think that's all we can do. It's nothing, but at the same time, it's everything to describe the world, to describe just what we see. Very often we feel that we are armless, that we can do nothing. And I think that many writers, when you are locked in your room writing, you're like, why? Why am I doing that? I'm not going to change the world. I'm not going to change anything. But at the same time, just telling a story, I'm sure, can change a lot of things or can transform a soul can help us all to transform itself. Or open people's eyes. I think what was so um, striking to me about one of the comments that you made at that session, um, you and you referenced the nearly 7 million people around the world, people like your grandmother who had never learned to read or write. And you said, quote, maybe the first thing we have to fight for is this fundamental right. Yes, of course. I was born and, and raised in a country where a majority of, of women couldn't read or write. And I can tell you that when you are a child and uh, you are the witness to, to that, it's something really tragic. I, I remember my grandmother, but also my nanny. I remember her when she saw me for the first time write my name. 
and she couldn't. And she lived all her life in the dark, not being able to understand the laws of her country, not being able to read the prescription of a doctor, not being able to convince or be convinced, and actually not to be able to be a real citizen and to have your rights and to fight for your rights because you are in the dark. And you know, after COVID, so many women, so many young girls in the world won't return to school and they won't uh, have an education. And a woman who is not educated is a woman who is more likely going to marry very early or is going to be victim of aggression. And it's a woman also who will have a lot of difficulty to educate her own daughter. So it's something so important today to give an education to people. How do you want to fight against conspiracy, against fake news, against so many things that are threatening us today if we don't give the possibility to everyone just to read and write. So today, one billion people in the world have difficulties just to write, to read a sentence. One billion. One billion to read a sentence. You know that in France, for instance, convicts in France, 30% of convicts in France can't read or write. Two million and a half people in France, I don't say in Morocco, in France, can't read or write. So I think that's a very, very important problem and it's a conversation we must have. And I don't understand why, especially in Western countries, we don't have this conversation. Probably also because those people feel very humiliated because it's very humiliating not being able to read or write. You feel that you are an outcast, that you are in the margins and you don't want to tell anyone. That's something you are very ashamed of. And I think that we really need to fight against that today. Leila Slamani, okay, human rights advocate. I, I might argue word activist, okay? It's very, I mean, I, I think it's critical what you are talking about. And um, Tracy mentioned, I, uh, I wanna explore the power of storytelling. When one cannot read or write, it then inhibits their ability to tell their own story. Absolutely, um, because it, first of all, I think that it gives them the impression that it doesn't count, that they don't count, that they have no importance in this world. You know, in, in Morocco, for instance, it's very moving at the same time. When you are an educated person, people who are not, they always tell you, thank your mother, thank your father, because they gave you an education. And they, they have this admiration for people who are educated. And at the same time, as I said, it's, it's moving, but it's sad also. So I want to tell them, don't look at me as if I was like a sort of master or dominating you. I don't like this position. And um, yeah, so of course, it, it makes it very difficult for them to share their story because what is the place of people who don't have this skill that seems so simple for us, so easy, just read or write. For us, it's something so um, usual. We don't even imagine what it is to live a life without having that. And of course, it's also people who are very much manipulated because they hear, a for instance, during COVID, people would come in a village and say, you know, COVID, it's given uh, was in, by homosexual or it's this or that. People, they believe that because they can't go and read and inform themselves and try to understand why. So that's also the big danger of not being able to read or write. It's not only that you can't tell your story, it's that you are going to believe very untrue story and very dangerous stories. Let's talk about stories, this, particularly some of your stories, okay? Um, you have chosen to write about, I talk about a lot about having uncomfortable conversations and the need to, um, some of the, whether we're talking about race in America or, or race across the globe, whether we're talking about um, inequality or poverty, or we're talking about the crisis of folks not being able to read and write a food crisis, so on and so forth. We need to have these uncomfortable conversations. And you write about a number of these uncomfortable conversations people need to have. I mean, your first novel, um, Adele, it tackled sex addiction. Okay, your second, um, The Perfect Nanny. Um, it was a gripping tale about child murder. And your latest book, In the Country of Others, tackles issues of race, identity, colonialism. Talk to me a little bit about your, the, your latest story. 
Uh, first of all, about my, my topics, uh, I was raised by women with a very dark imagination. My grandmother, I used to spend a lot of time at my grandmother's house in, in the farm, and my grandmother loved to frighten us, my sisters and I. So, you know, in, in Morocco, especially in this region, in Meknes, during the summer, it's very, very hot, and it was really difficult to, to sleep. So she would say, okay, come in my room, I will tell you a story, and then you, you will sleep and she would always tell us terrible stories she's uh, telling you nightmares yeah about little <laughs> girls who were murdered and uh, um, about a father who would eat his own uh, daughters but at the same time with my sister we would love that we were afraid we had nightmares but we were like okay go on go on another <laughs> another girl who is killed please and my mother was the same my mother was very anxious always telling us about all the bad thing that could happen. You know, I was r really raised like an indoor cat. My mother was like, um, don't go out because you could die and people could rape you <laughs> and people could kidnap you. And uh, so I can't ride a bike. I can't drive. I can't barely swim. I can barely swim because my mother was like, oh, you're going to die. So I was always thinking that, wow, there are so many ways of dying that's terrible so i think that i had so many nightmares and that i was afraid of so many things that at one point i was like yeah i think i want to share with people because i want them to be as afraid of, as me it's unfair that i'm the only one picturing all the time how i'm going to to die and be raped and kidnapped so i think that's why i always write about my nightmare because i want to give them to you so i can get rid of them well, well, one nightmare turned into a movie, so I mean, I, mean, I think you put it on the pages beautifully. I'm so interested, the, your, your recent novel, and as uh, folks mentioned in the introduction, it's a trilogy, and so this story is the story of your grandmother, um, and then the next story will be the story of your parents, and the third story will be the story about you. So you're going to have to tell me about those in just a moment. But before we go there, the, the, this particular novel, the first in this trilogy, it's not only a... I would call it a dramatized account of your family, but you also tell the story of the Moroccan revolution. And I find it so interesting how you intertwined these two stories um, and to document a very important part, but very difficult part of history for a number of people. Yeah, you know, um, in, in France, you have a sort of colonial literature, but it's much more about Algeria. Algeria is the center of the colonial literature and you will find no books about Morocco, about Tunisia or even about other countries. And I was very frustrated about that. And also, um, for a very long time, I wanted to write about Morocco because I was raised with this idea that um, European novel is universal that an American novel is universal. When you read it, it's supposed to speak to everyone. And it, uh, the truth is that when I was young, when I was 12 or 14, I was uh, reading Faulkner or I was reading Camus, and I could identify myself to those characters. And I was like, yeah, okay, it's a universal literature. But when you are American, writing about Morocco, people will say, oh, it's interesting, it's exotic, uh, couscous and all that, thank you. Mm -hmm. But it's not universal. And that's why I wanted to write a trilogy. I wanted to write about the history of this country from colonialism to nowadays. And to show to people that, of course, this country is not just a country of camels and uh, uh, Corne de Gazelle and Marrakech and Riyadh. It's a con con very complex country with a history, with fights, with uh, uh, people who want to be modern, other who want to be conservative. And that's also a country that had a very, very, very fast evolution. Because if you see the life of my grandmother and my life today, it is, the, the gap is immense. And I think that Morocco in 50 years had an evolution that many Western country had in one century or one century and a half. And I think that it's very important now for Western people to look at countries of the South of country of the third world, as we used to say, as countries who had also a history and we have stories to tell. 
You know, I remember that this is a very bad souvenir, but I remember the day when Donald Trump spoke about Haiti saying it's a like crap country. Oh yes, I was, well, I was on television yeah. that day. Yes, he yeah. called it a shithole country. Shithole country. And uh, I'm going to tell you something that is very sad, but when I was a, a child, I thought that I was living in a shithole country because people made me think that. Because when you see all the time people who want to Uh, uh, go out of your country, people who want to migrate, when people criticize all the time and all this, at the end you have this idea that you come from a shithole country. And that's also why I wanted to write this trilogy, to say to all the young boys and young girls of my country that no, it's not a shithole country. And we have a lot of things to, to tell and a lot of beautiful novels to, to write. So it's not only about speaking about colonialism, it's trying to be in a journey and trying to follow this family who is going to evolve at the same time that the country also is going to evolve. I love that. What are we going to learn? Yes, we can clap. We can clap. Yes, it was beautiful. Yes, we have a live audience here. We want to hear you. I, I could listen to you talk all day, honestly. Uh, so what can we expect to see from the second part of the trilogy and then the final piece? The final piece is about you. The second piece is about your parents. I think it's probably easier to write about your parents than it is to write about yourself. No? Um, yeah, you know, I have. Uh, there's a journalist in France who asked me, is it easy to write sex scenes between your parents? And I was like, ah, you know, not really. Uh, uh, so, yeah, no, it's, it was not the best moment. And, um, and they, they said also, what did your family think about the novel? And I was like, they are all dead. I'm very lucky because, you know, for, an, for a novelist, it's... Uh, Really, it's a love to have your all your family dead because you can write a lot of things. You can say what you want. Brother. No, no, no one yeah. approaches. And my and my mother is very nice. She would never say anything. Uh, but now she said that she goes to the supermarket and people come to see her and say, "Oh, I didn't know about you and your husband and this uh, <laughs> sexual." Oh, wow. <laughs> So yeah, I think it's not very easy for her. <laughs> so yeah, the, the second part is about my my parents and especially the end of the 60s and the hippie movement in, in Morocco because Morocco, like many countries, was uh, very much influenced by the hippie movement, by Marxism and was aware of everything that was happening in the world. And my parents met the day when the first man put his um, feet on the moon. And um, my mother always says that when he said uh, un petit pas pour l'homme, a, a little step for man, a big step for humanity. I don't know how you translate it. Just one small step for yeah, man. She always says uh, he, was, he was talking about me. He was talking about <laughs> us. And I was like, oh, no, maybe not. But, uh, <laughs> I cannot wait to read these. Okay, let, let's... I want to also talk about Layla the Diplomat because I find it very interesting that um, particularly this novel, again, you are, you are, you are writing about colonialism. It was, it was the French. Okay. Just, okay. It was the French. It was the French. So I'm very interested in the, in the, in, in that dynamic and juxtaposition. Um, I was reading an article I'm a, uh, an interview that you did, and you talked about the letters that you received from people who lived during that time, who were diplomats themselves in um, Morocco, and said, you've got it wrong. The Moroccan people, they really enjoyed this. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, one day I was in Normandy and I was presenting my book and at the end of the conference a man arrived and uh, with his wife, but his wife was a little behind, she looked very shy and he arrived and he said to me, I want to talk to you, okay, uh, the father of my wife and he showed his wife like it's the father of my wife, he was uh, in Morocco and he owned a farm uh, and uh, I don't understand what you're saying in your book because everyone in Morocco loved the father of my wife, I was like, okay, good for him. And um, and I don't understand, you're very aggressive towards French people. And I was like, no, I'm not so aggressive. And I said, you know what, maybe the father of your wife was a very nice guy. And maybe he was loved by people who worked with him. Of course, it happened during colonialism because nothing is totally black or white. Nothing is totally good or bad. So probably there were also good people who treated uh, the Moroccan well. I said, yeah, okay. but." you know what, colonialism was a bad thing. And in terms of philosophically, it was a bad thing. And he looked at me and he said, oh, who knows? 
I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> think parts and, of the world would beg to differ. Uh, end of conversation. But you know, um, I have no hatred, and um, I've never. Really why do you? Why do you feel the need to say you have no hatred? Because I would never have assumed that you had a level of hatred. But because he thought uh, I had hatred, and he thought that I was writing with a uh, desire of revenge, mm. and that's what I tried to tell him that I have. Uh, do not have that. And you know why? Also because my grandmother was French and my grandfather was Moroccan and they lived during colonialism and their life was very difficult. My grandmother, because she was white and she was married with an Arab, was an outcast for the French community. And uh, all people would make fun of her because she was poor. She was living in what people used to call the bled, which is the countryside, she was living with Arabs, and she was speaking Arab, and because her, her children looked like Arabs, and there was like mixed race children, and everyone would make fun of them because they had hair li like me, and I think that my grandmother, she suffered a lot, but at the same time, this couple was extraordinary, and they always tried to make a step toward the other. I remember that my grandfather, when I was a child, my grandmother, because she comes from Alsace, Alsace is a region of the east of France, where people love Christmas very much. And my grandmother, she loved Christmas very much. And in Meknes, in the countryside, it was not that easy to organize Christmas. But my grandfather, one day, he went in the countryside during the night, and he stole a tree. And he brought back the, the tree, and it was not like a tree, a Christmas tree, it was a tree. And he put the tree in the living room, and he said to my grandmother, I understand that in your tradition you want a tree, and put some things on the tree, so I brought you a tree. <laughs> and it was very nice and very moving, and my grandmother always told me this story. And when I was a child, my grandfather, who was like an Arab man, very shy, who would never speak and be very, you know, tough. He would put, he would disguise as um, Santa Claus. And um, it was very weird, and I was so afraid of Santa Claus. And he would arrive on a donkey. So he was, he was on a donkey, and he was Santa Claus, and the donkey would stop. Ah, ah. And my grandfather used to say that if a donkey stopped, the only way to make him move is to turn his testicles. So I would see Santa Claus turn the testicles of the donkey, and I was like, what is Santa Claus? I hate him. So that was my idea of Santa Claus. So that's what a mixed culture family does, that you turn the testicles of donkeys during Christmas. Yes, please clap for the donkey. And Santa. The Arab Santa on the countryside. <laughs> I just, I can't. I love you. I, honestly, I'm a fan. So um, I, in addition to hosting this very fabulous show on MSNBC, prior to that, I had a long life, even though I'm very young, in politics. And my last job in politics, I was a senior advisor and chief spokesperson to Vice President Kamala Harris. And I was with her. Yes, we can clap for the Vice President of the United States of America. She's fab. Uh, and I was with her on her last trip to France um, to meet with uh, President Macron, and it was an amazing trip. Uh, I don't, I don't know, I don't see the ambassador, but I, I mean, they rolled out the red carpet. We love the French, okay? Um, and I was struck, though, and I'm always, I'm always struck when I would travel with her um, because it is the first time for so many people when they have seen a woman of color represent the United States of America, and. Um, She's the first woman, first black woman to serve as vice president. And I, every time I travel to a different country, um, particularly when uh, I worked in the federal government, I was always struck by the, the people of color I did not see in my counterparts. And so I'm wondering, how is it for you personally to represent France as a diplomat, as a French Moroccan woman? What does that mean to you? Um, you know, when I met President Macron, we had a long talk, and um, he made me a first proposal that I refused because as many you women... You turned down President Macron? Yeah, but you know, as many women, when I feel that I can't do something, that I don't have the competence, mm. I say no. You know, that's something that I think a lot of people should do when they feel that it's they don't have the competence to do it, but anyway. <laughs> 
Um, but President, so, but President Macron, he persisted. Yeah, no, but you know now the the, the Prime Minister in France, who is a, a a woman, she just said today that she did some interviews for people of the the government, and that she received a lot of men who were like, "I'm the man for this job. I can do it." And she received a lot of women who were like, "Oh no, no, no! I don't think I can do it. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't have uh, all the skills." And so yeah, so I turned out the first proper proposition, and then at the end he said, "Okay, you're a writer." Uh, your job is language and I know that you love French language very much you come from a country Morocco that is a multilingual country and French language has still a lot of importance in in my country Morocco would you like to be my representative of French language and for me um, it I think that I accepted also because in my country today there is this idea that um, being francophone is first it's being a bourgeois and then that we should uh, not speak French anymore, that French is a colonial language, that we should forget about that. And especially the Islamists, they are very conservative in, in Morocco, they say, don't speak uh, French, we have only one language and this language is Arabic and you should only speak that and we have only one culture and one tradition. And I don't believe in that. I think that yes, of course, French arrived because of colonization, but you know what? Arabic arrived also because of colonization. Well, talk about it, Layla! That's what we call a gem, ladies and gentlemen. A gem has just been dropped. And I, I hate the idea of um, um, ideologizing a language. Uh, a language is not an ideology. A language for me is poetry. It's love. It's laughing with someone. It's making love with someone. It's not about an ideology. So this is my language and I think that a woman with my color and with my face can completely represent French language and th that you don't need to, to be Marie and you don't need to be blonde to represent French language. And I want also to say that to Moroccan people and to Senegalese people and to Tunisian people to say you can be proud we have this language we speak multiple languages and the next generation we will be multilingual and we will travel all over the world and we will share a lot of things don't believe those who say that you have only one language and who want to to, to, to close the, the, the boundaries and to want to have a little life very small because life is big and you can meet a lot of people. Be proud of this language because it's yours and you don't have to justify yourself. Your parents uh, fought for independence and against colonialism, but this language, it's ours as much as it is as French people. Yes, yes it is. Uh, we are going to turn to some questions from the audience. We have some of our amazing, I said our amazing interns. You know, honestly, the French embassy might need to give me a job. I am here to volunteer. Uh, I'm going to get some French lessons. If y'all invite me back again, I'm going to be, I'm going to have to speak to the ambassador and the chief of mission. Ma'am, we'll be chatting after this. We are going to take some questions from the audience. Our interns are going to um, come around with microphones. They are going to hold the microphones, okay? So all you have to do is ask your question. They will hold the microphones, and they will come to you. So please raise your hand. And we are taking questions, ladies and gentlemen, not soliloquies. We're taking what? Questions, questions. yes, questions, not comments and soliloquies. So uh, get ready for your questions, and I will ask another question while people are formulating their actual questions, because I know there was someone out there with the soliloquy that is now reconsidering, um, as always. I, I guess I'm very interested to know from you, um, uh, I think around the globe, globally, the global community is dealing with um, the fact that so many people have lost faith in institutions. They've lost faith in their governments. They've lost faith, they, people do not believe that governments can work for them anymore. We're dealing with it here in the United States of America. It's, it's happening all over Europe. It's happening across the globe. And I'm wondering, um, you strike me. I, don't, I just met you, okay? But you strike me as a person that believes in the power of institutions, that believes in our participation, that it can change things. I'm wondering, what is your um, message to people out there that say, mm, I don't really know if the government is for me. I don't really know if, 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 if I believe in this whole systems thing. You know, I would never judge them and I would never tell them that they are stupid not to believe in it or um, that they are wrong because I can completely understand why some people wouldn't believe in institution because we are not all in the same place and we are, we, 
we don't have all the same privilege and the same chance in life. Um, I'm very, very aware, and I have always been, of how lucky I am. I was born in a family where I was educated, when I had the possibility to travel, to study in France, and to do whatever I wanted with my life. And, of course, my vision of institution, because I understand them, because I can an analyze them, is very different from someone for who the institutions are so far, and people are speaking in a language that they don't understand, that they can even feel is despising them. So I would never judge them. I think that maybe I would shut up if someone says that to me and I would say, okay, explain me why. I want to understand. And uh, sometimes the best way is not to try to convince people that you're right, but try to understand why people in front of you don't believe the same as you. So I think that if someone like this was in front of me, I will buy him a drink and, and tell him, okay, let's have a discussion. I want to understand why you lost trust in the institution because um, it comes from somewhere. The art of uncomfortable conversations. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, we're gonna take some questions. What is your name, sir? Henry. All right, Henry, we're gonna go to the front first. I'm gonna let Professor Layla, she's gonna call on the people. Oh, we're gonna hold the microphone, yeah. Hi, my name is Contessa Bourbon. I'd like to ask, France is considered an industrialized country and progressive. How come there are 2.5 million French who, uh, who can't read and, and write? What are in literacy programs of the government to, to help, this, um, to help uh, uh, improve literacy? It's a great question. You diagnose the problem, so what is the solution? Yeah, so um, actually there are what we call in France, I don't know the translation in English, illettré, which means that they went to school, they learned how to read and write, but uh, in the course of their life, they um, lost those, those skills. So they are able to read their name or to write their name, to sign something, but they are not able to read a book or really yeah, uh, use this competence. Uh, I think that today we have to build a national plan uh, against illiteracy. Uh, and I think also that we really need to have um, a, converse, a public conversation about it. Because as I said, what is very difficult is that those people, because they are very ashamed of that, they don't go to public institution to say, okay, I have a problem with the fact that I can't read or write, can you help me? They try to um, hide that or to live as they can without this skill. So we have to find a way to fight against this feeling of humiliation. And I think also that it's going to be a very good way to fight against extremism because the fact that you feel humiliated and that you feel an outcast and that you don't want to have relationship with institution because you don't want, you are ashamed you are also probably going to be more convinced by people who say they are treating you bad and uh, you should vote for me, all this is because of stranger and blah, blah, and blah, blah, we know, we know all that. And the truth is that uh, those people, those two million and a half people, they are in very specific region of France, disindustrialized region that lost a lot of jobs, people who are uh, unemployed and whose life is very, very difficult. So um, I think we should build a sort of national plan for knowledge. And I even think, and um, I was speaking of that with um, Salman Rushdie, telling him that I think that in the UN, we should try to um, advocate for a found, a big found. You have found today for uh, food, education, but a found for knowledge in the whole world. And my idea is that us writers, but also publishers and all that, we could give a certain percentage of our money from what we, when we sell a book for this found and this found would be used to help people access to knowledge. And I think that it's the big fight of the 29th century because without that, uh, democracy is in danger, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. We'll take another question right here, sir. We'll bring you the mic, we wanna hear you. Thank you very much for, for your talk and for coming to Washington. The question that I have for you is really more on the literary line. 
I'm very interested where you view yourself on the continuum of Moroccan authors. For many years, we had people like Tahar Benjaloun who spoke about oppression under a very repressive regime in Morocco. We also had people like Dries Schreiber who wrote about the condition of Moroccan hood or Moroccan ship, if you know, we can invent a word. And, and then, you know, for a long time, that's all we had. People, you know, that we consider to be giants of Moroccan literary um, authorship. Um, and then recently, there seems to have been an explosion of authors, which is wonderful in many ways. Um, and so my question to you, I understand that you like to write about human rights. Um, I read your books, and to me, they're really mosaics, you know, of detail, of life, of many, many things. But I, I wanted to understand where you put yourself on this continuum of uh, Moroccan authors. Do you view yourself as part of this history of Moroccan authorship, or do you trace your lineage more to France? Where do you fit? Where do you see yourself fitting? Who are you? Um, I see myself nowhere, and I fit nowhere. And... Um, I never view myself, I don't look at myself, and I don't analyze my work. Um, I think it's not my job, it's the job of uh, people in universities or literary critics to do that. Um, you know I live like an animal. The, all I'm interested in is wake up in the morning, not have a shower, go directly in my office and write, write until I... I die until I go to sleep, until the rest, I don't really care. I've never analyzed myself. Um, I don't want to be a giant like Drish Raibi and Tar Benjeloun. It's not my, my thing. You know, I, I try to stay free and I don't have, I don't have a place. I've never felt that I had a place in the world. I never felt that I belonged to anywhere. Um, I don't feel really French or Moroccan, I would say that my only country, the only place I belong is the body of people I love. Um, I belong to my children, I belong to my mother. This is my country, my only country is the people I love. And this is the only country for whom I would die. I can go to war for them. I'm not sure I can go to war for just a country or because I was born here or there. So no, I don't, I don't belong. And I feel at the same time lonely and free. And I feel that I have no territory, but it's good for a writer to be a sort of nomad, to have no roots um, and to try all the time to find a place. That's why you write. That's why every morning you go and you write because there is something that is wrong with the world, something that is going wrong, something that you want to correct because you don't accept reality as it is. You know, I think that the first person who said once upon a time is a person who believed that the reality as it existed was not enough, that you had to imagine that once upon a time, maybe it was different and that once upon a time, it will be different. And um, so, no, I, I don't know. You will have to ask professor and people and they will tell you <laughs> where I belong, but I don't know. I do want to follow up on this question, though, because I, I find the question fascinating and your answer even more fascinating. So when you won the, the pre grand court, working on my French, y'all, working on my French. I mean, how did you feel? What did you think? You, 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 you really feel like you have no box. Yeah, I feel like in a sort of a movie, you know, like in the Truman Show. I was like, what's happening? What? Are, why are they all taking pictures of me? And then you go, you know, in the restaurant called Rouen, and you go at the window with your book, like a sort of a Miss America. And people were taking pictures of me. And it was so weird. And uh, it was very funny because, you know, I, I live, as I said, like an animal. I live like an ermite. I don't go out very much. And so I didn't know anything about the jury Goncourt. So when I arrived, they were all, hello, na, 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 nice to meet you. And I didn't know their names. So I was very, very uncomfortable. So I said, okay, I'm sorry. I have to go in the bathroom. I was pregnant. And I went to Google them to try to remember their, their name because I didn't even know. But um, 
you know, uh, as I said before about belonging to the people I love, I think that for me, the most moving moment of the Prix Goncourt, because my mother, as I said, has a very dark imagination. So it was just the day before the Goncourt and she said, you will not have it. It's impossible. No, no, no. I don't want you to be disappointed. So I tell you, it will not happen. Okay. I was like, okay. And she was in, in Morocco and during the night, I think that she had a dream, so she went to the airport and she took a plane at like five Randomly. in the morning to arrive in Paris. Wow. And so when they called me to tell me that I had the Goncourt, of course, the first person I called was my mother. And my mother, I speak to her like two or three times a day and she always answers. And she didn't answer and it was on her machine and I was like, what? The day of the Goncourt, she doesn't answer to me. What is she doing? And so I arrived to win the prize and she was there on the street. And um, I think that just the look in her eyes, that was the best prize I've ever won in my life. She said nothing and she didn't say I'm proud or anything. She just sat and she looked at me. Amazing. Okay, we'll take another question. Okay, we will take, yeah, we'll take one back there. Yes, ma'am. Hi, good, good evening. Thank you for being here. Uh, I would like to talk, to listen to you talk oops, <laughs> about uh, Chanson Douce. Um, so I, I'm a mother myself, living in the US, coming from Europe, and that book, speaking about the struggle of a young mom trying to find childcare, trying to balance those two, three, four, five sides of her life in, in a country that offers so much more than here to help young, mo young moms. It kind of made me, oh my God, if they can't do it over there, how can we do it here? And so my question is, so do you, after, after thinking about it, after, what's the solution? Uh, what do you do if you want to have a career and you want to also have a, be a mom? And is it is it the solution? Right, those scary stories about about an nanny killing your kids, or uh, so that's my question. Like, how do you how do you do it? Oh, you know, I think that if I had the solution, I would be traveling all over the world. I would be a sort of guru, very rich, telling to women what is the solution to have to have it all because. I don't have the solution, and I think that no one has the solution. The thing is that I belong, I think, to maybe the first, one of the first generation of women to whom people said that my parents told me, you can have it all. You can have a career, you can have children, you can marry or not marry, you can travel, you can have also an individual life, a social life, you can have it all, and it's going to be wonderful. But it was a lie, because... Um, Yes, you can have it all, but I'm not sure that you can have it all at the same time. And that, of course, you have to make sacrifice sometimes. And that sometimes you are very tired. And sometimes um, you want to, uh, to kill yourself or to kill your children. Um, and you know, I remember that when I arrived in Paris, I was 20 years old. And I looked at Parisian women and I was like, wow. Their lives seem so wonderful and so glamorous. You know, they wake up in the morning, they take their little bag with their very glamorous and beautiful clothes. They don't have a lot of makeup, but they have this glow, this crazy glow. They go to work and they work in art or whatever. And then at the end of the day, they take the bike again and they go to a, a art gallery or a cocktail and they go back to their children whose name is inspired by a novel of Victor Hugo and their children eat vegetable and play violin. And I was like, wow, I want this life. But the truth is that I met those women and those women became my friends. And what I can tell you is, is that many of them drink too much. Many of them cry in the bathroom and many of them feel a lot of loneliness and uh, think that life is very, very difficult for them. So no, I don't have the solution. What I can tell you is that um, when you need help, you should ask for help. When you can't do it, say, I can't do it. Um, when I won the Prix Goncourt, my, I, I was pregnant, as I said, and the day I gave birth to my, my child, 
my husband gave me the most beautiful gift you can give to a woman who has a career and children. He resigned from his job and he stopped working for two years. And he stayed with the children telling me, you have- Yes, clap for Layla's husband. Some cheers in the back from the ladies, yes. And he told me, you have a great opportunity now. You will not win a prize like this in another moment of your life. So I'm going to take care of the children and you're going to, um, to enjoy. And there's another thing is that I was, I was raised by a mother who was a superhero. My mother was working all the time. Um, and she would never, she was working, she was taking care of us, she was going to, to shopping, she was cooking, she was uh, hosting people, uh, the, my, my father's friend and all that. And you know what, she would never complain. And do you know why she would never complain? Because if she complained, my father would say, you wanted to work, no? So don't complain. That's your choice. You, you choose to work. And that was the ideology of, at that time. But I've always told myself, if I want to complain, I will complain. And I complain all the time. And I arrive at home and I sit on the couch and I do exactly like my father did. I take a beer and I say, what are we eating tonight? And I think that you should give this gift to yourself. That's also the problem, is that we were raised with the idea that we are superheroes and that mothers are goddess and that we are supposed to be, to do everything and that our children need us so much and that a father is not like a mother. You know, when I travel, I remember the beginning of the Prix Goncourt, my mother, she would call me and she said, oh, where are your children? And I'm like, well, their father, you left them alone. And I'm like, no, I just told you with their father. So there is also the thing that ourselves, women, we have to accept the idea that a father can be as important as a mother. And we have to give a place and a space to men in the family. Okay, you will cook also, and you will help me. And it's just normal. Um, I don't want to do everything and I don't want to be the main character of my familial history. I think that my husband can be the main character and I, it's not bothering me. I'm not feeling that he's replacing me. You know, all this theory of replacement, it's everywhere. No, <laughs> you know, it's everywhere. And I think that even in the house, and I think that's not about replacement, it's about sharing. You share a life, uh, you share also the dishes. All right, I think we have time for maybe two more quick ones. I, I'm gonna let you pick. Okay, here. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. Next one. Hi, uh, good evening, Leila and Simon. Uh, thanks for this uh, discussion, I really enjoyed. And I really like what you said, Leila, about the language and the colonization. What you said, it's all right, uh, French Arabic, but there is another language. It's not language of colonization. It's the Berber language. It's the language of Morocco. What do you think as, uh, as activists for human rights to help those little kids in Morocco, in the Reef, Agadir, Meknes, to read and to write in a Berber language? In first today, uh, the huge number of immigrants from Africa, North Africa, they speak Berber. They live in France, they are French citizens, but they don't know how to read and to write in the Berber because there is discrimination against this language for a thousand years, this Berber language belong to one of the old civilization in North Africa for 5,000 years. Are you thinking about writing something about this, uh, this issue in the future? This is my question. Thank you. Oh, you know, I think that uh, in Morocco we had a great revolution in terms of uh, Berber and teaching Berber because Morocco is the only Maghreb country that recognized Berber and Tamazir as an official language. And uh, now we, uh, in school, in every... Uh, um, uh, Berberian uh, uh, region, you have school in, in Berber. When you, you go in, in Morocco uh, on the maps or in the streets, the, the name of the streets and the names of the road, it's in French, Arabic, and Berber now. And um, you know, when I was a child, it didn't exist. And it was something we would never speak about. It was a taboo. The Berberian language was something that was completely forbidden. And now I'm very, at the same time, moved and happy and proud to see that, yeah, we recognize this language. So it will take 
time. It would like a lot of time. And um, now we have also a lot of academics that are making research about the uh, Tamazir alphabet. And it will take time, I think, for the Moroccan population to really use this language and to create in this language. But to be really honest, I'm, I'm very optimistic. And I think that we, it will have a, a great place in the um, literature and artistic creation in, in general in, in Morocco. If you, if you look, if you compare, for instance, to the Algerian situation, it's much more difficult because they don't have uh, an institution like we have in Morocco that is financing a lot of research and studies on, on Berber, but um, we need that. And um, I, I am not a Berber, and um, but I was raised by two uh, Berberian nanny. And was, when I was a child, I used to speak Berber very well. And unfortunately, I forgot everything when I was like seven or seven or eight. But um, yeah, I completely agree with you. It's a very important part of the Moroccan culture. We will take this young lady right here, and then there was a woman back here, and we will take you, ma'am, right there as our last question. Hi, Layla. Thank you first for your passion for language and reading, um, or writing, excuse me, my end reading. And reading also. Yes, okay. <laughs> my question is this. Um, you mentioned, and there exists a lot in the world of intense polarized opinions, um, conspiracy, fake news. In How would you recommend getting started in having conversations that are uncomfortable with people you care about most? Because... You seem to know so much. <laughs> I'd love to hear. Uh, no, you know, as I said, um, I, I am not a guru and I'm not very good at giving advice, but um, as a writer, I think that I learned something. It's empathy. And I learned how far you can go with empathy. You know, when I try, when I begin a novel, I have multiple characters and at the beginning, I, I don't really know them. I learn to, to, yeah, to know about them and I spend a lot of time with them. And sometimes at the beginning, I don't really like them or I know that they have flaws or they think I don't like the way they see the world. I don't like the way they think. But I will tell you that spending time with them, even if I don't agree with them, even if I don't share anything with them, I can like them. And I can recognize the fact that they are human beings. You can always find um, some light in a human being. Uh, you know, there is a quote by Van Gogh that I love very much. Um, as evil as is the devil, you can look sometimes, you can look at him in the eyes. And I think that the most important thing is to look people in the eyes and to never lose the respect for the human being you have in front of you. Maybe this person is bad. Maybe the way she thinks makes you not only uncomfortable, but very angry. Uh, but you have always tried to use this empathy, this um, possibility that we have as human beings to um, put ourselves in other shoes is something so extraordinary. And I can tell you as a writer, uh, I feel that I can always save the souls, even the very bad and dark souls. I feel at the end that there is something likable. No one is lost forever. No one is a bad person forever. There is always the possibility of being saved. That's, that's why, you know, I work a lot in prisons. Uh, I spend a lot of time in France in prison and to go read in prison and to uh, help people write novels in, in prison. And because I believe in second chance and I believe that no one is condemned for life. You can always have the possibility to create something to find a light inside uh, of you and how do you want people to believe if you don't believe in them so i think that the best you can do is try to use this empathy and not always try also to um, uh, have something from other people sometimes you give and you will not take and it's not a problem there you know we live in a society where i give you you give me uh, and I'm not supposed to give you and not receive something. And it's not a problem. Uh, I think, I, I believe in gratuity in, in, in terms of relationships. Sometimes you can give and you receive nothing. You will receive later. That's not a problem. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll have our last question right up here at the top. Yes. You know, Layla, this has just been so enriching, so fulfilled. I mean, you keep saying you're not a guru, but... 
I think you're a, a word guru, I must say. I mean, you won the award. Thank you. Um, I, I have a quick, well, maybe not so quick question. Um, uh, I'm of Haitian origin, and one of the things that I'm struck by uh, is the, um, the fluidity of language in the culture in which I was born. In other words, uh, oftentimes families go in between French, English, Spanish. I grew up in a multilingual family. And I, my question is this, in terms of the theater, which I think is one of the, the most accessible, if one is lucky, forms of art for many people. Is there in France that kind of um, multilingual staging of, of theatrical works? Um, that's my question. I think this is a great place to end. Yes, that's yes, there is. There is in France. I think that um, in terms of theater in France, we have a great great diversity of uh, um of things to to offer and um if you go um i don't know not only to paris but if you go to paris you you can go in a theater and hear something in arabic or hear something in farsi or there was a very very successful uh play in paris that was played in vietnamese for instance and everyone was completely crazy about this play and it was a play about multilinguism and about the Vietnamese community and how they struggle between French and, and Vietnamese uh, language. So yes, of course we have that. And I think uh, to be honest that it is the future. We're going to be more and more multilingual and it's good. I think that the next generation for them, it's absolutely normal or not unusual at least to hear multiple languages to switch from one to another you know i, I live now in, in in portugal so uh, at home we speak french and um, my daughter she goes to a school where she speaks portuguese and english and uh, the other day she went to a friend who is portuguese and they are speaking portuguese at home and she came back home and she said mom i don't understand <coughs> In this family, they don't have a home language like us. <laughs> and she thought that French was like our home language, like our secret language. And I was like, no, you know, a lot of people are speaking this language actually in many places in the world. But for her, it's very, yeah, she, she doesn't even question that. She she goes from English to Portuguese, and uh, uh, you can see also in, in Morocco, you know, you take the bus in Morocco, you go in the street, you will hear people speaking on the phone, and they mix sometimes two, three, four languages, Arabic, English, French, Berber, and they mix all that, and it's both very uh, funny, very intelligent, and very creative. Uh, and, I, and I love that, and that's a new way also of, of speaking. And I, I think that for many, many years, um, the problem with French language and with um, the way we used to, to teach French language was that a lot of people didn't dare to speak French when it was not perfect. People say, ah, if I don't speak perfectly, people are going to look bad at me and they are going to judge me. And now when I travel as a francophone uh, uh, representative, I always say to people, you have the right to speak Fran uh, French and to make mistakes. People are not going to judge you. Um, I think it's something that is very different with English. If you travel all over the world, people will speak in English with you and they make mistakes as I do. You know, uh, I, and I don't feel ashamed. Sometimes I'm looking for my words and that's not a problem. I'm trying to share something with you and you will, I'm sure, forgive me if I make mistakes. So uh, that's why I say people tell them, excuse my French. You can excuse your French if you don't speak very good French. Leila Samani. Thank you for such a thank rousing you. Thank conversation. You very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you all for being here. Thank you, Simone. Thank, thank you. you. Download the podcast and follow along. Y'all have a great night. Okay, give it one more round of applause. This was so good. So amazing. Thank you all so much. Thank you to the French Embassy, as always, for having me. When I come back, please excuse my French. Uh, it will be better next time. Thank you to the Chief of Mission. Thank you to Ambassador Etienne. You all have a lovely evening, and there is a reception right outside the doors. Thank you so much.